My name is Eric Romer. I'm the pastor at Greentown Wesleyan Church in Greentown, Indiana. And on behalf of Bread for the World Indiana, I want to welcome you to our conversation on feeding the economy. We have prepared a lineup of speakers uh, today that are going to share with you this important issue of feeding our economy literally through addressing the issues of food insecurity. Dollar for dollar, the best investment we can make in a growing community, a growing economy, is making sure people in our community have access to food. It creates a larger, healthier, uh, and a better educated, better prepared workforce that we need to create more jobs and produce more value in our economy. I wanna thank our speakers that have made it a priority to share with you today from their information, their expertise. Ms. Michelle Hummel, Dr. Heather Eicher Miller, and Mr. Eric Halverson. I also wanna welcome a special guest and thank him, Senator Mike Braun, who's going to be doing a question and answer time with us. We wanna thank Senator Braun, who last year was a co-sponsor of the Global Nutrition Resolution that passed through the Senate with unanimous vote. A resolution that expresses the continued drive in the United States to make sure that we're leading the way on combating uh, malnutrition in women and children around the world. We also wanna thank Senator Braun, who was an early voter to support COVID relief packages to make sure with all of the other troubles and trials during this very difficult season, American families didn't have to add food insecurity to that list in new ways. Thank you, Senator Braun. We wanna welcome the president of Bread for the World International, Eugene Cho, and the director of government relations for Bread for the World, Mrs. Heather Valentine. There are a number of other people that we would like to, to, to say thank you for joining and being part of this today. Staffers representing Congressman Jim Banks, Congressman Jim Bard, and Congresswoman Victoria Spatz, CEO of Alanco, Jeffrey Simmon, CEO of Agrinovos, Mitch Frazier. Denominational leaders, including Dick Ham from the Disciples of Christ denomination and Joanne Lyon from the Wesleyan Church. There are a number of people that are representing the Indy Hunger Network, including their executive director, Kate Howe. And there are a ton of people that are joining us from the Purdue Extension all over the state. There are people from numerous churches that are tuning on today, from local food pantries and a number of other non-for-profit organizations addressing hunger issues in Indiana. We wanna thank you for being part of this. Most importantly, we wanna thank the over 450 Hoosiers that are participating today from 73 towns and cities across our state who understand how important this is our God-given directive to care for widows and orphans, particularly by making sure we feed the hungry. You understand that this is not a cause, this is not a, an activity that we engage in, but as people of faith, this is part of our identity. This is our purpose at the very core of who we are as Christians, as Hoosiers, and as Americans to take care of each other. Thank you for joining us today. Now I wanna welcome Reverend Fatima Matus, the deacon of the Episcopal Diocese to lead us in prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you and ask for your presence as we gather here today. But God, we pray for everyone who is hungry and in need of spiritual as well as physical nourishment. Whether they live here in our local communities or thousands and thousands of miles away. We pray to let your love, mercy, and grace to pray to flow through us and our elected leaders as we try to meet the needs of those Jesus called the least of these among us. You have so richly blessed this country that no one should go hungry. We pray that you will empower us to do whatever needs to be done to see that your gifts are shared with all in our community, nation, and the whole wide world. Merciful God, hear our prayers for a world that continues to struggle to bring COVID-19 pandemic under control, which has disproportionately affected people of color and the elderly. We give you thanks as vaccines are becoming available for this virus. 
we are especially grateful for all those who have worked tirelessly to develop these vaccines that will restore our communities to wholeness and health. And we pray that the whole world, rich and poor, we have access to these vaccines, especially those places where medical resources are inadequate and overwhelmed. We ask for your blessings on all who, following in Jesus' footsteps, give themselves to the services of others. Too. We ask for continued wisdom, compassion, patience, and courage as we all minister to the poor and the needy in his name. Give us the grace to hear the prophetic words of Dorothy Day, who reminded us that we must lay one break at a time, take one step at a time, because a pebble cast into a pond causes ripples that spread in all directions. We pray, gracious one, that our lives and those of our elected leaders be a clear reflection of your love and compassion in all situations. And now, most gracious and merciful God, we must confess and lament the heaviness in our hearts and souls as we mourn the death of our brothers and sisters to avoidable and preventable mass killing. We remember before you lives locked in fed ex shooting in our community less than a week ago, and we call them by name. Holly Smith, Samaria Blackwell, Matthew Alexander, Amari J. Satan, Davine Cowell, John Wessert, Amari J. Johal, Jasmine Dasik, Braddon Hall. We will now observe one minute of silence in remembrance of their lives and also the more than 3 million people who have died due to COVID-19. Loving God, receive into your loving care the souls of those who have died in any incidents of gun violence. Give comfort and healing for survivors and give peace and comfort for those who have lost loved ones to gun violence. We pray that our elected leaders will have the grace, empathy, courage, and compassion to legislate laws that we protect and care for all your children. And all God's people say, Amen. After college, I started working for WIC and, um, and I just loved it. And then, you know, fast forward 10 years, I meet my husband, I have two kids. We actually moved to Ohio for my husband's job. About a year into it, maybe a little less, he lost his job. Uh, Violet was four and Isabella was about six. We struggled for to pay our rent. We struggled with everything, um, including food. I put Violet on wet because again, it was just, I mean, it was a tremendous help because my husband and I, we had only lived there like less than a year. So when I went into WIC, they provided me with um, community referrals for uh, low-cost child care, Medicaid, SNAP, other programs that help people that, you know, even, I think we got help even to pay our electricity bills. My husband then found a job and he started working again. So we were able to actually stop using WIC because 
we didn't need it anymore as well. But during those eight months, it was just such a sense of safety with food, with all around just security and with community referrals and the I see a lot of stories like myself. And I also see families struggling um, that use WIC from their pregnancy until that child is five years old. And the benefit of using WIC for those years are that you've got the special nutrition, you've got the nutrition counseling, you've got referrals while you're pregnant to help help you have a healthy pregnancy. As the WIC program is extremely cost effective because providing means to a healthy pregnancy and having a full term baby and getting the baby as healthy as you can for that first year of life is going to be not only more beneficial to mom and baby, but it's going to save those health care costs. It's going to. So with my family, we very much appreciated the help we got from WIC because it provided us. Um, a safe place to make sure that our children stayed healthy, that Violet received the, the nutritional uh, benefits of the food package, that my entire family learned from those community referrals, and we could use those referrals to make sure that we could end up finding new jobs, you know, just being productive in our society. And I am happy to say that Violet is an honor student at St. Susanna, and she is a wonderful volleyball player. So I'm sure those fresh fruits and vegetables uh, helped with that. But I mean, most importantly, honestly, is that it just, it gives you a little peace of mind when everything else in your life is crazy and you're worried about it. WIC, WIC allows you to have a, take a deep breath. Michelle Hummel is a graduate of Purdue University where she earned her executive MBA. She currently works as an organizational strategy consultant. She's worked with the Indiana State Department of Health and the Marion County WIC program. She's worked with the Indiana Women's Prison where she piloted a supplemental nutrition program for pregnant inmates and also to promote mother-infant bonding. She's continuing her education with project and project management and organizational change through Cornell University. Michelle has presented her work and shared her research all around the country. And now she's joining us today to do the same. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, thank you for the opportunity to curl my hair. I, I don't consider myself a public speaker or an expert, uh, especially via Zoom. But if there's one subject I'm passionate about, it's about the health and well being of our children. And I mean, all of our children. I've spent most of my career helping organizations with strategic direction, including WIC programs here in Indiana. And while my clients have changed over the years, what fulfills my heart has not. I was a passionate WIC partner for many years and I'm thankful for this opportunity to share some insights with you all today. WIC started in 1974 and stands at the intersection of food security and public health. It is more formally known as the Special Supplemental Support and Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, and serves millions of participants nationwide. The program is also known as the nation's most success successful and cost-effective public health nutrition program, serving about 53% of babies born in America. For those of you who may not be aware, WIC provides nutritious foods uh, to supplement diets, as Sarah had said, and information and education on healthy eating, as well as breastfeeding support and healthcare and uh, referrals to, and critical, to critical social services. With this said, the US spends about $3.5 trillion on healthcare spending, yet Americans die earlier and face greater levels of disease than almost every other country. Hunger and malnutrition are not solved by any one program or policy, 
but WIC can help reverse this trend by ensuring access to maternal and child nutrition programs and can play a critical role in lowering those massive healthcare expenditures. WIC is also known as the nation's premier public health nutrition program. Decades of evidence-based research and reviews confirm this recognition. As we've mentioned, WIC is cost effective. It more than doubles the return on initial investment in medical, educational, and productivity cost savings. And although WIC should be recognized as universally beneficial, it should also be recognized as a program that promotes racial equity and better black maternal health. Uh, WIC's nutrition interventions reduce the likelihood of preterm birth, low birth weight, infant mortality, birth defects, and childhood obesity. WIC prevents complications due to malnutrition, and again, in turn, reduces Medicaid spending and ultimately NICU costs as well. We are encouraged by the decline in infant mortality and the infant mortality rate here in Indiana, as announced by the Indiana State Department of Health and Governor Holcomb last fall. However, he also noted, our work here is not done. Programs such as WIC continue to help reduce infant mortality and studies have shown that WIC narrows the divide between infant mortality rates of black and white participants. Unfortunately, many eligible families do not participate in WIC or drop off the program due to a variety of barriers. Prior to COVID-19, only 51% of all eligible women participated in WIC. And there's also a dramatic drop in participation once the infant turns one. Some of the research I worked on concluded that eligible people actually don't know that they are eligible. In addition to this, the drop in participation after the child's first birthday is also because the process can be overly complex to become certified and then use. We know the first 1,000 days of life are a time of tremendous potential and enormous vulnerability. How well or how poorly mothers and children are nourished and cared for during this time has a profound impact on a child's ability to grow, to learn, and to thrive. According to 1000days.org, this is because the first 1,000 days are when a child's brain begins to grow and develop and when foundations for lifelong health are built. Health that keeps our Hoosiers strong and in the workforce. Health that enables Hoosiers to serve in our military. Poor nutrition in the first 1,000 days can cause irreversible damage to a child's growing brain affecting their ability to do well in school and to earn a good living and making it harder for a child and their family to rise out of poverty. It can also set the stage later for obesity and diabetes and chronic diseases, which we all know can lead to a lifetime of health problems. There are several things that we can do to help reach more family to save lives and to improve health outcomes. There is more work to be done with WIC. We can use technology to modernize and streamline WIC services and shopping experiences, meeting the needs of low-income mothers. WIC families face an inequitable and challenging shopping experiences with outdated regulations requiring benefits to be redeemed in person. We can promote better collaboration with healthcare providers and offer more referrals. And with increased funding, WIC has the opportunity to increase eligibility to address the existing nutrition gap for school-aged children, as proposed in the recently introduced WIC Invest in Our Children Act. This proposes eligibility through age six or the beginning of kindergarten and help streamline that access to school meals and closing the gap between WIC, when WIC currently ends at age five and when school meals usually begin at age six. 
Enhancing ask, access to nutrition assistance programs not only means fewer hungry kiddos, it also is a vital strategy for addressing the rapidly growing cost of healthcare due to food insecurity and poor nutrition. WIC has contributed to healthier pregnancies, increasing increased breastfeeding rates, improved birth outcomes for low income women and infants, and healthier growth and development for young children. This is worth our time and it's most definitely worth our investment. To America's families though, WIC means so much more than science-based outcomes and numbers. To them, WIC is a safe and a welcoming home where there is no shame or blame, where the, we can share the joys and anxieties of parenting, where we celebrate with delight new babies and growing young children, and where we honor with pride moms and dads doing their best for their families. It is where families receive dependable health, nutrition, and social support and guidance, generously offered with love and care to the families we assist. With certainty, we know WIC families that WIC is a hand up in the midst of a world of uncertainty. As a blessed mother of three, when I say we as moms, but as dads and grandparents and aunties and uncles and foster parents and friends too, we wanna give our kids the best start and the best life possible. I am confident that you will agree there are no red or blue babies and young children, only the faces of our nation's future. When we reach and teach and keep families engaged with WIC, we know that their future as individuals and families are healthier and brighter, and our future as a nation is healthier and brighter too. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your support of our future and being here today. And thank you for your patience with technology. Thank you, Michelle. Now we, we do, we are patient with technology. This is the first time we've done a webinar and we thought, you know, as we're stumbling through this and we're trying to figure out the best ways to do this and look professional, what could widen that gap larger than invite an Emmy award winning journalist and TV news anchor uh, to join us and be a presenter. So we invited Eric Halverson to make us all look a little bit worse, but then also to show with us after uh, show us um, where he's been since he left, left Wish TV and joined Kroger. Eric Halverson is the uh, coordinator for corporate affairs for the central district of the Kroger company. He directs the division's philanthropic work, in particular with the Zero Hunger, Zero Waste Plan, which is Kroger's commitment to end hunger or to a commitment to hunger relief and sustainability. He's going to share with us today what he's been doing, a graduate of Butler University and someone very well known here in Indianapolis. Would you welcome Eric Halverson? The, I'm the shallow end of the gene pool on this panel, but by virtue of my role at Kroger, I do continue to learn about SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance, and its importance to the people it serves. Our interest at Kroger comes in part from our broad corporate philanthropic commitment to hunger relief. So messages such as this in a card from the Food Bank of Northern Indiana became emblematic of our hunger relief mission. You see the question for a child, what is worse than having to go to bed? Going to bed hungry is the answer. Now in 2017, with such concerns in mind, we launched Zero Hunger, Zero Waste. That, as you said, our plan to end hunger in the communities we serve and do so by 2025. We've said from the beginning, we can't do it alone. So we work in partnership with food banks and other agencies across our division. Now, SNAP and its precursors predate the modern food bank network that is so important to feeding the needy in our country today. SNAP is obviously an essential part of the national safety net for disadvantaged Americans. And I came into today thinking it only reduces some of the demands on food banks. Well, an expert tells me SNAP provides nearly half of all food assistance, public and private, three times what food banks do. 
So the program doesn't just ease the demand on food banks. He says it prevents a tsunami of demand that food banks would be completely unable to deal with were it not for SNAP. Well, a trip to any grocery store reveals one of my early lessons from joining Kroger. The country does not have a shortage of food. You can see that in just about any picture connected with Kroger. It's evident as soon as you walk into any of our stores. We have thousands of products on our shelves, some Indiana grown, others from across the country, still others from around the world. American abundance is in our stores, but for various reasons, it is out of reach of too many people. And one hunger researcher said, this is a disturbing observation. In some American neighborhoods, drugs and guns are more accessible than healthy food. COVID com compounded the access problems when it pushed people out of work. And these are people who never imagined they would worry about providing food for their families. Grocery stores and other food retailers are a resource to all of them. And at Kroger, we wanna be here to help our fellow, fellow Hoosiers regain their economic footing and put their lives back to normal. Our stores are among 5,100 SNAP retailers in Indiana and nearly 250,000 nationwide. Now that's traditional grocery stores such as ours, plus big box superstores, regional grocery chains, independent grocery stores, convenience stores, and farmer's markets. The vast majority of SNAP benefits are spent at larger stores, but most retailers who offer SNAP are small enterprises. And I doubt that many, if any of them, would provide their SNAP data. The grocery business is intensely competitive and that's proprietary information they'd wanna protect. One investment banker said those supermarkets are under assault by various big name, big money competitors. So with profit margins at one or 2%, meaning we keep only one or two cents out of every dollar spent with us, no one wants to divulge any internal data. Now, one analysis called SNAP a meaningful part of the grocery business, and it's certainly an important element of our division's business. And I'd say that's true for all participating retailers. For smaller grocery companies though, and independent stores, SNAP purchases may be essential to their success. The vice president of sales at one small company told a reporter, if SNAP dollars fall, her store's sales will fall too. SNAP dollars go to work quickly. Unlike the gift cards many of us get and then tuck away in a drawer, SNAP recipients are living paycheck to paycheck and their benefits go right into the economy. A national calculation estimates the total SNAP collections across the country total in the range of $56 billion in benefits for food. But there is a ripple effect. By another estimate, every dollar spent on SNAP generates another $2 in the local economy. One food bank representative says it's really more than that. She said every dollar spent in SNAP becomes $6 for the local economy. And that's because SNAP does more than provide food to people who need it. It supports jobs at grocery stores, farmers markets, the companies that put food on the shelves, the trucking companies that put food in the stores, and the farmers who grow it. Consider also that at Kroger alone, we employ more than 20,000 Hoosiers, so the ripple effects are significant. Consider the array of products covered by SNAP. Customers can go to the grocery store for products not available consistently at their food banks. We're talking about meat, milk, cheese, maybe eggs. Then they can use their SNAP cards at the food banks to gather more of the standard and readily available products they have. One food bank leader told me more money in SNAP reduces demand on food banks and food pantries because customers can shop at grocery stores and get much of what they need. There's also research that praises SNAP for the way it helps struggling families find such research resources with, as one researcher put it, almost no government administrative overhead. Now, those are the most common positives in the program. Research also uncovers a prominent negative. For example, the trick may be just getting enrolled. My homework for today taught me that is challenging. I visited Food Finders Food Bank in Lafayette recently and they'll tell you signing up is difficult. That's why they have resource coordinators to help people through the process. Joel Berg, the CEO of Hunger Free America has said enrollment is often a great burden 
But once someone receives the benefits, it's usually relatively easy to use them. And it is the low overhead for the government because it merely transfers money electronically onto EBT cards and then recipients are able to use the money to buy the food they need. A SNAP expert at the University of Illinois said, the government should make more money available for SNAP. Dr. Craig Gunderson has said government should expand the eligibility threshold for SNAP and permanently increase its benefit level. He said that with low grocery store prices, that would let the SNAP dollar stretch a lot farther for safe and nutritious food. And I'll conclude with one thought from another person from the deep end of the gene pool, Dr. Michelle Jerkovich. She's a political scientist at the University of Massachusetts and the author of a book about hunger relief advocacy. Her concern is bigger than Kroger, bigger than the grocery business and bigger than SNAP. She worries that there is no agreement on who's responsible for ensuring that people have access to food and who is to blame when they don't. So she says, when there is no consensus on who is ultimately responsible for ensuring the right to food, it's difficult to effectively leverage social pressure to compel change. So she says the question, and it may be the question that brought a lot of us together today is whether the attention inspired by the, by the pandemic will be a short-term concern or something more permanent as we address the needs of our neighbors in the months and quite likely the years ahead. I'm proud to have a role in this discussion today and I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Eric. As usual, compassionate and ethical business is also good business. And there aren't many programs that can boast a one to six return on investment. It's something that we should pay attention to. We wanna welcome Heather Valentine, the Director of Government Relations for Bread for the World Now. Thank you and good afternoon. I have the great pleasure to introduce Senator Braun today. As many of you know, he was elected to the Senate in 2018 after founding and leading Meyer Distributing in his hometown of Jasper. In the US Senate, he sits on the Budget Committee, the Aging Committee, the Health, Education, Labor and Pensions Committee and the Agriculture Committee, where he will play a key role in the reauthorization of the Child, Nut Reau Child Nutrition Reauthorization, the Farm Bill and work around food systems and food security. His leadership in ag makes sense. He is also a tree and turkey farmer, as well as an avid hunter of mushrooms. And just today, he introduced a bipartisan bill to break down barriers for farmers and foresters interested in participating in carbon markets. I am so happy to introduce the senator, a proud Catholic, and thank him and his exceptional staff for all the work they do to push back against hunger and poverty in Indiana and across the United States and abroad. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dave Miner a leader on hunger issues in Indiana and in Washington. As many of you know, Dave has spent a dozen years working only on hunger issues through bread in Indiana. Dave, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Heather, and welcome again, Senator. Um, My pleasure. I wonder if you'd like to make a couple of remarks to start this uh, Q&A, or do you want me to lead off with a question? Well, very brief ones, because I'll have to get to the floor to vote here in uh, roughly 10 to 12 minutes, so I want to make the most of any questions. but keenly interested in uh, making sure that we have proper nutrition for kids. Um, I've been involved in farming, was a turkey farmer for 32 years and still involved to the extent you can be and still be a U.S. Senator. So uh, it, it's vitally important. Uh, hate to hear that you have food deserts around the state and that uh, we need to improve uh, the diet and nutrition for kids. It's so important to uh, try to practice that as I uh, have uh, learned more about it over the years. So very interested in the conversation and I'll give the floor back to you because, because uh, we may run short on time, but we do have about 10 minutes. So uh, any questions, uh, happy to answer them. Well, why don't we start? Um, I understand that your nutrition subcommittee will be holding hearings on a couple of topics. Uh, one of those is connecting local farmers to school nutrition programs. And what kinds of things do you see ahead there? Well, I think it's not a whole lot different than what we all enjoy uh, in terms of farmers markets, uh, which sadly they only, uh, like in Jasper, ours maybe last three to four months out of the year. There are um, increasingly more businesses that are looking, I think, to broaden out what they do 
more than just through a farmer's market. And that'd be where you had reliable supply of fruits and vegetables, especially from greenhouses and so forth, that I'm going to try to find how do you get that to become more than just part-time through the year. Uh, visited a place that's actually doing hydroponics and scaling it to where that can be done all year round. And to get to make sure that the people that run school nutrition are emphasizing fresh fruits and vegetables. So uh, it'll be to explore how we can do more of that. That sounds great. We look forward to hearing more about that as the hearings go on. Um, Michelle noted that um, WIC, which provides so many benefits, is not as widely utilized as it could. And we know that child nutrition um, has to be reauthorized and it's finally coming up again this year. Um, I wonder, do you think it might be possible that we can find cost-effective ways to enhance enrollment, for example, by reducing administrative barriers? I think that'd be uh, hopefully some low hanging fruit that we can get done. Uh, I think uh, the nutrition part of our budget uh, will be renewed at levels. I think that's had a good track record over the years, but when it gets to actually utilize more of what's available, uh, that is something that uh, even on my um, uh, committee as well, we need to find out how we get better utilization. I think that's maybe at around 55% of what it should be. That's a lot of room to make up and uh, that'll be a focus of our attention as well. Your staff mentioned that you were interested in knowing more about the metrics and impacts of COVID relief uh, efforts. And I wanted you to know a couple of things. Uh, one is that the um, Indy Hunger Network and Bread for the World and other groups in the state have a lot of relevant information, which we'd be delighted to share with your staff. I wanted to mention we did a pair of studies in February and June last year, um, which showed that the pandemic relief um, did actually a really good job of keeping people from going hungry. Um, between February and June, the need for food basically doubled. And between the public sector programs and the private sector programs, uh, we met almost all of that need. So at least in the food assistance space, um, the things that we have been doing um, have been working. You got a question related to that, uh, where kids weren't able to uh, be at school in person, where it was virtual learning. Were we able to still maintain that uh, connection with good nutrition when they were at home? Excellent question. And in fact, the pandemic uh, EBT program, um, which uh, Congress uh, uh, created uh, quickly, uh, did a great job of filling in um, uh, the school meals the kids were not getting at schools. Um, that is, the school meals program is the second biggest source of food um, in any given area. And so getting that pandemic EBT set up so quickly um, was really key and it worked. Very good. Um, Bread for the World is a, is a faith-based group. Uh, we work with um, all kinds of groups, uh, secular and, and uh, faith-based, um, but I'm interested in how your faith informs your thinking um, about um, people who are struggling to put food on their table. Well, I come from a community that is as deeply uh, faith-based as you can find. Uh, Jasper, which is 8,000 people when I grew up, is now 16,000. We have three parishes within our city limits, probably uh, nine to 10 others scattered around a county of 42,000 in population. You can see how important it is. And that heritage, many of us German Catholics, has now broadened to other demographics, which is great. And um, it, it's uh, part of uh, any uh, life is to be well-fed, both spiritually and in your own body or temple as well. And I think that you find that in the scriptures uh, so often and uh, the Catholic charities and all the work they do, uh, not only within the country, but outside of it, uh, constantly aware. And uh, my wife and I, and uh, our business that was lucky enough to grow over many, many years. Uh, we support many of those organizations. 
Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I know we're coming up close. Do you have time for one more or do we need to let you go to the floor? We do. Go ahead. We'll, we'll have time for one more. Okay. Um, in my corporate career at Lilly, um, we talked a lot, of course, about containing costs. Drug development is an expensive process. Um, but we also knew that investing was key to our future. Um, so my question is, um, you know, might investing uh, a bit more than we have been in our kids uh, be a good investment um, for the future of Indiana and our economy? So investing in education, in good nutrition, in health, uh, all of that pays dividends, return on investment of a better life. And I know in, in my own business through our healthcare system, we have emphasized wellness. Uh, we emphasize preventing uh, engagement with the healthcare system because it can be costly. A lot of times it's hard to have access to it. And the first line of defense, and I try to encourage that in terms of the wellness that we promote within our company uh, as a U.S. Senator is to make sure that you are fed well and that you're eating the right food because uh, the apple a day keeps the doctor away. Uh, we knew that back when I went to school. Now we have so much more information about really what mix of nutrition is important. And when you do feed yourself well, it, it surely does set, put you in the best place to avoid all the issues that can come from as you age, especially uh, get the habits inculcated, started when you're early, because in many cases, it's diabetes. It's something that has eventuated because of diet that wasn't healthy for your body. And then remedi remediation is so much more costly than preventing it in the first place. And that's why at all levels, uh, state, local governments, private sector, and any of the stuff we do at the federal government, you get a good return on your investment by making sure that you've got good nutrition to prevent all the consequences that come along if you don't. Let's, uh, you're singing our song, Senator. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you again for your time with us today. And we look forward to working with you and your staff um, on what are those cost-effective ways um, to have those um, have those benefits. So again, thank you. My pleasure to be here today and look forward to continuing the conversation. Take care. Oh, that was great to have a senator with us. And um, now um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Heather Eicher Miller. I've had the pleasure to work with her um, on some projects. She is a graduate and now an associate professor at Purdue University in the Department of Nutrition Science. Her research is focused on food insecurity, which is exactly what we're talking about today. Um, she has uh, looked at immediate and chronic outcomes of food insecurity and looked at evidence-based interventions and programs. Um, it's my pleasure um, to welcome Heather. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here and um, to have this opportunity to um, be part of this event today. So I'm just um, getting my slides up here. And um, I really, my, what I'm gonna talk about, I think it really kind of um, summarizes a lot of the main points that we've already mentioned today, but I wanna give a little bit more context to what food insecurity looks like in Indiana. And um, so, this term food insecurity, it means not having enough food, but we can actually quantify um, food insecurity using a survey that um, asks households about their ability to have enough food. And it also asks about the, whether they can, um, whether they're eating the kinds of food they usually eat because of the resources they have. And so when we use this survey, um, we can, group people into being food insecure, which includes, you know, either having, not having the kinds of foods they usually eat or not having enough. And that not having enough is the more severe 
situation and that's called very low food security. So when we um, track those things over time as we can using the um, census survey that includes food insecurity, we can see um, if you look at the red line on this graph, food insecurity in the US in our last national estimate was around 11%. Um, and that's kind of, we've recovered from the financial crisis there. You can see um, how it spiked up in 2008. Um, and the more severe level of food insecurity is shown there as well at around 5%. So um, that's when people aren't eating enough. Um, it's the amount. Our goal set forth in Healthy People 2030 is for us to reduce that 11% of food insecurity for all US households to 6%. So we do have a ways to go. And um, when we look at just food insecurity in Indiana, our estimate is around 12% currently. So, and that's in the shown in the blue line there. Um, of course, the pandemic is going to um, inflate these estimates by quite a bit. Uh, Feeding America has made some projections uh, for food insecurity for 2020, and we expect that the national rate of 11% will go up to around 16%, that's shown in red, um, and Indi for Indiana, we'll jump up to around 17 to 23%, shown in blue. So um, this is kind of our snapshot in time in an annual way. But um, food insecurity is actually even a more common experience when you think about someone's adult life. And um, there is a study that has shown that about 42% of all Americans will experience food insecurity at some point between ages 20 and 65. So um, that is very meaningful, especially when you think of all the things we've heard said about the health and the um, economy. But I wanted to, to kind of uh, talk about those things a little bit more. So um, the Dietary gui Guidelines for Americans gives us the best diet to promote longevity and to reduce chronic disease. And um, when we think about that as our standard, and then um, already most Americans aren't eating very healthily. Um, we have a high burden of chronic disease in this country, but for people who are food insecure, um, they're worried more about having enough than having the right kinds of foods. So it means less uh, vegetables, fruits, key food groups, um, and less nutrients like calcium, iron, and fiber, and then too much added fats, added sugars, and added sodium. And all of those things, you know, add up to poor health, as we've heard. Um, specifically for children, it means more acute sicknesses, um, more asthma, iron deficiency anemia, low bone mineral content, and poor mental health. And then for adults, these things, you know, over time, um, we get more chronic disease, as the senator mentioned, um, but higher burdens of diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular diseases, cancer, and poor mental health. And of course, this means a lot of healthcare costs. Um, it also means that our Indiana businesses will lose money um, because of workers who are missing work more often, they can't perform as well, and they're more likely to also have increased healthcare costs from chronic conditions. Our schools are also um, losing money and children are not learning as, as much because they're going to school hungry, they're missing school more often. Um, you can't you know, perform your best when you're worried about food. So they're also more likely to drop out of high school and um, not get as well of paying jobs. And then our school systems are actually penalized for absenteeism that can result in reduced funding. So, um, you know, the, the burden of all of these things compound. And um, we could estimate their cost in a rural county. We have many rural counties in Indiana. They're shown in white in this um, graph of Indiana. And um, those are counties less than 50,000. If we estimate the economic cost of food insecurity using, there's a calculator online to do this for um, some counties in Missouri. 
So I chose a similar county uh, to some of our Indiana rural counties of about 33,000 and the costs added up to around $20 million. So, um, you know, that's a lot, even if it's not completely accurate for our counties. Um, but the good thing is that SNAP, um, the food stamp program, as we've heard, can really help reduce this economic costs. Um, it can, it's estimated for this county to reduce those costs by about 2 million. Um, just some other quick information about SNAP. Um, it's usually used in the short term, so less than two years. Most households using SNAP are working. They're trying to get out of the situation and most include children. Um, and then many, most Americans actually have used SNAP at some time in their life. So um, it's a very broadly used program and it impacts so many of us. Another program that can help is the SNAP education program. Um, we've done a study to show that this program improves food security in the long term. Um, and this program offers education on budgeting and nutrition. So once you have that education, you can use it forever. Um, it's, education is something that can't go away. So it's very cost effective and um, it can help. Of course, there's still a great need. And um, so some potential solutions could be extending SNAP benefits, decreasing the gap in participation and eligibility, which we've already heard mentioned, um, increasing funding for SNAP education, supporting programs like WIC um, in school, lunch and breakfast, and then not forgetting our older children, our, our college students, um, and how they might be able to access SNAP as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Heather. That was, I knew, you'd, I knew you'd bring the data. That was great. And thank you for including college students. We know that food insecurity on college campuses runs 40%. So it's a very significant issue. So at this point, um, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Reverend Eugene Cho, president of Bread for the World. Gene, before joining Bread for the World last year, built a mega church in Seattle. He founded an important nonprofit called One Day's Wages. He's authored books, spoken widely on faith and justice, and we're delighted to have him at Bread for the World and delighted to have with him with us today. Welcome, Eugene. Thank you so much, Dave. It's an honor and a pleasure to be able to join you. Uh, especially for this Indiana event. This is a very much of a tangential comment, but it was always my dream to play for Indiana's basketball team many, many years ago, but I wasn't good enough. But this isn't my personal therapy session. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to all gather together uh, to seek the common good for our neighborhoods, for our city, for the state of Indiana, for our nation, and also the larger world. I wanna first thank every single person uh, that took time to join us for this particular event. And obviously all of the presenters, uh, the prayers, Senator Braun for his uh, time with us as well. Uh, I thought I would maybe just share a couple of reflections from what Senator Braun shared. I know that he had to rush off for an important vote on the floor. What I heard was um, an elected leader who cares about his state, who cares about his community. And this is important because oftentimes in a very hyper politicized and polarized nation, we have to keep reminding ourselves as we all work for the common good, that hunger is not a partisan issue. What I heard was that he was committed to children and nutrition. This is important for us to amplify because I know that if you're anything like me, sometimes it's really easy to vilify other people that might not agree on every single aspect of our political inclinations. But hunger, when it comes to children, when it comes to nutrition, when it comes to human dignity, when it comes to flourishing, it should not be a partisan issue. So I want to again applaud Senator Braun for coming on this particular call and sharing those very commitments. I also heard that he understood the importance of improving 
diet and nutrition, and that he's also been on a journey like many of us. When I learned about the hunger crisis 20, 30 years ago, for many of us, the main priority was how do we get more calories into human beings? And over the years, we've learned that it's so much more uh, nuanced and complex. There's more of a, a data and science to it. So it was encouraging to hear him even share about his own journey and even today learning more about the reality of food deserts that exist, the aspect of racial equity and the lens and access to food. One of the questions that I often hear from people, not just at Bread, but in many spaces and places that I speak at, people ask me this question. They'll say, uh, Reverend Cho, uh, where do you find hope in today's world? And it's likely that maybe you have either asked that question or others have asked you that question. During a time when there is so much pain, so much brokenness in our world, and we can go on a litany of things in the past year in 2020, and certainly even in the first few months of this year. So the question is, where do we find hope? And if I'm being truly honest, there are days when I find myself very discouraged. January 6th would be an example of that day. Uh, when my uncle passed away because of COVID in December of this past year. But today I wanna share with you why I find deep, compelling hope. It's this event. It's the hundreds of people from over 70 cities and communities, from so many churches that are on this call that took time on this day because they said, loving my neighbor means that I have to also care about their dignity and their human flourishing. I find hope because of all the presenters, technology issues or not, slides galore or not, Emmy winners or not, prayers or not, and to have the Senator Braun join us, all of these things are deeply encouraging. But the question that I think we have to ask ourselves is we can't just allow this moment to give us a daily encouragement. It has to be fueled for what we do after this webinar. It has to compel us to consider how do we live tomorrow. So it's with that in mind, I want to introduce you to one of my colleagues at Bread for the World, Reverend Patricia Case. Now, Reverend Patricia Case might be someone that some of you, many of you might be familiar with. She is Bread's organizer in the beautiful state of Indiana. And when we speak about grassroots, her position really is grassroots. It really came out of people and communities and activists and churches collectively in the state of Indiana saying, we need to be able to find someone. We need to be able to fund someone. We need to activate someone to partner with us. And the answer to that work and the answer to that prayer is Reverend Patricia Case. And what she's going to be sharing with you is really about that question, what do we do after being inspired on a webinar, the next step? So Patricia, I'll pass the mic to you. Thank you, Eugene. Well, friends, you've been on the listening end of the webinar this afternoon, but it's about to be your turn. We want to hear from you. I'm here to invite you to conversation-sized meetings this week, times when you will have a chance to debrief what you've heard here, to ask maybe some of the questions we didn't get to, and to learn more about how Bread for the World works to end hunger. So three things that you can expect in the coming days. First of all, tonight, I will be sending an email to you all. It will detail a 45-minute debriefing session for your congressional district. 
You can use the Zoom link I send you to join us while today's event is fresh on our minds. Both will be conducted the next three days. Then next week, I will send links to May and June workshops that are designed to empower your leadership as an, as an anti-hunger advocate. And then finally, some of you are already aware of our annual offering of letters. It's one of the ways your entire congregation can respond faithfully to Christ's call to change systems that create hunger. I'll share how you connect your congregation to that important advocacy opportunity as we launch this year's letter writing campaign. Now, my job is to meet with all the 450 people who registered for this event. So memorize this space. Watch for my email. You'll find my contact information right after the benediction and be ready to take some next steps in Indiana organizing. Eugene will end this meeting with a benediction, but we all know that each ending signals a new beginning. I look forward to new adventures with you. Eugene? Thank you, Patricia. Friends, as we close, in a moment, I'm going to pray a benediction, but just a moment. I want all of you to know so much data, so much numbers, so much stories have been shared behind all of these data and numbers, let's remind ourselves, underneath all of these things are men, women, and children, human beings created in the image of God. These are our friends, our neighbors, family members, folks within our congregations. I'm here to also share with you about 30 years ago, a long time ago, uh, we went through a very challenging season in our family. And had it not been for the WIC program, my wife and I, and then our two children, we now have three children, all in college, would have been a very difficult time. And so not only is it a safety net, but I think it's an opportunity again for our neighbors to experience an opportunity for flourishing. I can't think of a more worthwhile cause for all of us to gather together. So friends, if you can, just for a moment, if you're comfortable, close your eyes and bow your heads. And friends, would you receive now the benediction? Fellow friends and neighbors, Hoosiers, go forth from this place with renewed inspiration to do the work of God. May our hearts experience joy for the things that give God joy. May our hearts break for the things that break God's heart. Seek good, not evil. Love goodness and establish justice. Care, learn, advocate, come alongside others, amplify their voices and struggles. This is the greatest offering we can make. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Go in peace with love for our neighbors. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray, and all God's people said, amen. God bless you, friends.